Okay, well, I think we are now broadcasting live. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining today. This is uh, clearly extraordinary times and we're doing things a little differently. Uh, the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary has been running a series of roundtables on electricity markets for the past several years. We started a few years ago looking at the potential for renewables in Alberta's electricity market. Last year, we ran a roundtable looking at the role of storage as we move forward. Uh, this year, the talk was going to be on market design in Alberta and what changes, if any, are required as we move forward with changes in the underlying electricity market. We've moved that to a webinar event, uh, as is understandable, and we're really thankful to have the folks we have uh, together here today to help us in this conversation. So just a little background, because I know many of you are joining from the US as to why we're having this conversation. In the past several years, we've seen a lot of underlying change in our electricity market in Alberta, in large part driven by um, policies related to uh, climate change. We've had a movement to phase out the use of coal power in Alberta, which has been to date the dominant power source. We've also had a growth in renewables through both legislation procurement policies, and just part of a global trend in terms of falling renewables costs, pushing forward more renewables on the system. This led to a move towards a capacity market as there was concerns for reliability and future investment. A new government has been formed and the cancellation of the planned capacity market occurred. As a result, more quietly than the cancellation, there was a, a request from the government uh, to our system operator to put forth recommendations to um, any changes that might be required with the current um, electricity market to support reliability going forward. That's the purpose of today's roundtable or webinar, to bring forward some, some expertise from other areas to talk about what, if anything, is needed to ensure reliability and sound market design. We are not reopening a capacity market discussion, but rather working within the confines of what we have and seeing what extensions are required. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my co-host here today, Sarah Hastings Simon, and a fellow fellow at the, at the School of Public Policy to introduce our panelists. Thanks, Blake, uh, and thanks all for being here with us today. Uh, I'm delighted to get to introduce our panelists. We have a wealth of perspectives that are coming from across North America. Um, and I think it's, it's really a great chance for Alberta to um, you know, learn more from other markets that are wrestling really with the same questions that, uh, that we're wrestling with here in Alberta. Um, and so we have uh, with us um, Sonia Agraval, the Vice President of Energy Innovation, uh, Cheryl Lafleur, the former commissioner uh, and head of uh, FERC, um, currently a board member with the, the New York, or excuse me, New England ISO. Uh, we also have Jacob Mays, professor of engineering at Cornell University, and Frank Wallach, professor of economics at Stanford University and former chair of the Market Surveillance Committee uh, for the California um, ISO. So I know that uh, we're, we're very lucky to have this group of panelists share their expertise with us today. Um, just some quick logistics before we get going. Uh, we do have the question and answer uh, box. If you go to the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll find the Q&A there and you can send in questions uh, with your name or anonymously. Um, we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. So please uh, send in lots of questions as we do want this to be um, you know, an interactive experience. Um, and so without any further ado, why don't we get started? Um, I'm gonna kick things off with a bit of a opening, brief opening statement uh, from each of our panelists. Um, and so maybe Cheryl, we'll start with you. Um, and we'd just like to hear from everybody in your view, what are the key principles that we should be following um, when we approach market design that's really gonna inform our discussion today? Well, thank you very much, Sarah. And thanks for including me in this. I think that any market um, design question has to start with the basics, which are obviously the delivery of reliability service to reliability of service to customers. I think a market operator has to use its best independent judgment of what's needed for reliability at reasonable cost, but that obviously has to take into account changes in resources, such as Blake spoke about being driven by climate policy and technological change. 
and that really covers all aspects of the market, but it seems that Alberta right now is really focused in on, laser focused on the operation of its energy market. So I think with an energy market, the goal is to set transparent prices that fully reflect everything it takes to keep the lights on. And that means in real time, incentivizing real time behavior, like following dispatch signals and everything that a market operator needs to pay to keep the lights on in real time, but also in the long term, because without a capacity market, you're relying on the energy market to incentivize assessment, investment for the longer term. And that means investment in the type of resources that you need for reliability such as fast wrapping resources to balance your renewables coming in. And with no capacity market to help incentivize future investment, it's especially important that the energy market fully accurately and transparently reflect the price of serving the next increment of load and be perceived as reflecting the price of serving the next increment of load, the marginal cost of production. And I think all of the changes that I understand Alberta is discussing, changes to offer caps, changes to price caps and floors, locational pricing, changes to settlement timing, all of those are a part of making sure the energy market is as granular as it can be. So I think you're having exactly the right discussion. Great, thank you, Cheryl. Uh, Sonia, I'll turn to you with the, with the same question about the principles for design. Sure, I think Sarah, and thanks for having me here. I'm very excited to be with uh, such an esteemed group and talking about such important issues in Alberta. Um, so last year, we published a series of papers about the future of wholesale market design. And those papers included 10 principles that help us kind of uh, provide a foundation for what wholesale markets should do. Um, the context for the paper is that we are in a situation where the resource mix is changing and that is happening all over the place, not the least of which in Alberta with the coal phase out and the other policies that Blake was discussing earlier. So I'll mention just a few of these 10 principles, um, but you can find the rest of them on our uh, website. So the first one is uh, making sure to eliminate barriers to participation for all new kinds of resources. So these can come in very detailed forms or um, kind of broader forms, but there are quite a lot of barriers for new technologies that are kind of inherent in a lot of market designs right now. So paying close attention to those and ensuring to eliminate them will be good. Um, supporting grid reliability so that the incremental costs of reliability do not exceed the amount that customers would knowingly be willing to pay or that they don't exceed uh, incremental benefits. So that's thinking about reliability in a little bit more of a cost-oriented way. Uh, promoting short-run efficiency through optimized dispatch of the lowest cost resource mix and using existing and emerging technologies to manage reliability and congestion. So there's quite a lot more options now for managing reliability and congestion than um, when a lot of these designs were first conceived. So um, ensuring to uh, use those to promote short-run efficiency will be important. Relatedly, facilitating demand side participation and grid flexibility is very important. Um, and then promoting long run efficiency, which is including efficient competitive entry to and exit from the market under conditions of significant uncertainty. So as we see this resource mix changing, ensuring that we have adequate signals for market exit is important just as market entry. Um, Finally, I'll just say enabling adequate financing of resources needed to deliver the cost effective reliability based on an efficient allocation of risk. So those parties in the market that are best equipped to mitigate that risk should be the ones bearing it. And that prevents customers from bearing the cost of poor investment decisions made by private investors. So there's a few other principles that we also talk about, but I thought I would just start there. Great, thanks, Sonia. Uh, Jacob, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Sarah, and, and thanks for everyone for, for joining in. I, I'm going to echo a lot of what uh, Cheryl and Sonia uh, said in that, uh, to me, the, the basic principle of market design is we want to promote uh, efficiency, both in terms of short-run commitment and dispatch of resources, and then uh, long-run investment decisions. So in the short run, uh, first off, what that means is that the system operator is uh, procuring the, the right level of reliability resources it needs to prevent cascading failures and, and really guarantee the conditions under which a market can even exist. 
And then second, we need to have a, a reasonable estimate of what the actual marginal costs for uh, resor resources on the system uh, are. So on the supply side, that means uh, mitigating offers of resources with significant market power. On the demand side, that means having some understanding of the opportunity cost of uh, curtailed load or, or load that, uh, that's, that's not consumed. Uh, in, in an ideal case, those short run prices also uh, feed into long run efficiency because you have prices that are uh, sufficient to support the kind of long run investments you need, uh, both in terms of the amount of capacity and uh, the, the right uh, amount and types of flexibility. Uh, in practice, a lot of jurisdictions have had trouble uh, maintaining support for uh, scarcity prices that are high enough and volatile enough to do both of those, uh, both of those things. And so uh, if you fail to accomplish that, you need to develop reasonable proxies in the form of resource adequacy requirements for the, uh, the types of uh, capacity and flexibility uh, resources that you need to have on the system. Uh, and that has been a, a difficult challenge in, in a lot of markets. Uh, two uh, other aspects of efficiency that I wanted to touch on. One is echoing Sonia's point, uh, part of efficiency is efficient risk allocation. And uh, so what we've seen, especially in ERCOT, is uh, you have extreme volatility in prices entails a need to manage that volatility for market participants. Opinions differ on the degree to which that should be managed uh, by uh, the market operator, by, by regulators, or uh, by market participants themselves. Uh, but that's clearly an important topic uh, to manage. And, uh, and then lastly, uh, we can only really consider outcomes efficient if we have an incorporation of uh, environmental externalities. And so I think in our context, we want to make sure that uh, the market design is in harmony with uh, public policy goals around uh, the uh, pricing of carbon or other pollutants. Great, thanks, Jacob. Um, so I'll, I'll turn things over to Frank to, to wrap us up with the uh, principles before we get into some more specific questions. Let's see. So I think I, uh, all right. Um, well, I just had, I have the, uh, I can just give this since it's better to look at this than me. So the, the big points that I wanted to talk about were four, which are essentially what are called the match between the market mechanism and actual system operation, uh, managing system-wide and local market power, and what I'll call symmetric treatment of load and generation, and then finally, a long-term resource adequacy mechanism. And for anyone interested, these are discussed in, in this paper. The basic idea of the match between the physical realities is, is the fact of if, is to run your market through the actual network that operates the system. This essentially means a locational marginal pricing market. Um, and in the case of, uh, of uh, as well, is being able to schedule in advance uh, what is gonna happen to resources. So this would mean a day ahead in real time, which is the current Alberta market only has a single uh, settlement, uh, a real time settlement. The other is the necessity of a system, uh, a local market power mitigation mechanism. Uh, the idea here is to be able to mitigate the offers of suppliers when they are deemed to be able to exercise uh, a significant amount of market power. That is something uh, that, that, that effectively should be in place uh, to uh, deal with those issues when a local market power problem arises. The final, this third point is this symmetric treatment, meaning that the default price that both load and generation pay in the market should be the real-time price. And if loads want to buy out of facing that real-time price, they have to purchase a hedge just like generation has to purchase a hedge. And in that sense, this provides the incentives for investments in storage, investments in low flexibility and the like. And the final point is this long-term resource adequacy mechanism. The idea here is the fact that it's not the distinction between an energy-only market or a capacity market. It is the fact that there is what, what I'd like to call a, a reliability externality. And this is essentially 
the fact that if we're unwilling uh, to commit to use the real-time price to clear the market under all possible system conditions, this creates what in the language of economics would be a externality in the sense that all consumers know that if there is a supply shortfall, there will be random curtailment, so they don't bear the full cost of their failure to purchase sufficient energy to, to meet demand under all possible future system conditions. So it is this existence of a finite offer cap on the short-term market that creates the reliability externality that essentially means that we need a long-term resource adequacy mechanism and in order to operate a market with a finite offer cap. And, and um, you, can, you can do that in such a way, there are a variety of different ways. Capacity markets is one such approach. Uh, energy contracting is, a, is another approach. But if what you're unwilling to do is commit to let price clear the market under all possible future system conditions, there is a need for a long-term resource adequacy mechanism. Hey, so th those are those my four points. Thank you, Frank. Um, that was quite impressive going through a 32 slide deck in a span of a few minutes. So thanks everyone for, for bringing that together. Um, I'd just like to remind everyone, I see some questions coming in. You're free to write in those questions and, and we'll try our best to get through to all of them as we go through. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna kick it off with one question. Sonia, this is for, for you. Um, you know, Underlying a lot of the discussion here about looking, re, looking at our market design again is this growing share of renewables and concerns that the variability is leading to new reliability challenges. So you've looked at this a lot. I just want to get your impression on whether that is the case, whether you know, market principles should be the same regardless of the level of renewable penetration, or, or do you think that the, the nature of this variable resource requires us to think differently? How do we think about that? Yeah, um, well, thanks for the question. It is one that I care a lot about and have thought about a fair amount. Um, so I was looking at the Alberta Energy Policy Simulator and noticing that um, the share of wind generation in Alberta is still relatively small compared to the overall share of generation. Of course, as coal phases out, um, we would imagine that low cost variable renewable energy sources may become a larger share of the market. But just to start there, we are nowhere near um, a penetration of variable renewable energy in Alberta where we would likely see lots of reliability challenges. Um, of course, as inverter-based resources increase, there are considerations that need to be um, taken into account. But uh, the main point is that variable renewables can be very reliable. Um, and it's about how we operate the market and the system uh, in, in new ways. So there's, there's a couple of different categories that variable renewables um, can be broken into, the predictable variations from them and the unpredictable variations from them. Um, predictable variations might include sunrise and sunset for solar. Um, unpredictable might be things like clouds coming over. But luckily, grid operators have experience with both predictable and unpredictable variation, especially at the levels where we're seeing renewables at this point in Alberta. So predictable things that grid operators already deal with might include planned maintenance at a power plant. Um, unpredictable might include things like unexpected loss of a generator or a transmission line. Um, but the chunks of variation in, that grid operators are used to are actually often larger than most of the variations that renewables provide in the system. Um, but of course, as we are you know, integrating more shares of variable renewables, we have to deal with these kinds of variations on a more kind of ongoing basis as opposed to just um, you know, events. So in order to do that, flexibility is really the key. Um, so this is all about exposing the value of flexibility so that we can elicit both the latent flexibility that already exists in the resource mix as well as eliciting additional flexibility that could be provided by new kinds of resources like demand side resources or storage. Um, so eliciting this flexibility, um, there's lots of options to do that. And I think Alberta is uh, considering quite a lot of those. So um, things are, are seeming to be moving in the right direction. 
Um, but just a couple of quick options to, to go through here, and we can certainly dive more into these later. But one is just basically requiring all generators to participate in economic dispatch. So avoiding self-scheduling, um, ensuring that the variable renewables also yeah, participate in economic dispatch, because sometimes it is the least cost option to curtail those renewables. Um, allowing negative pricing. I think that Alberta has a zero um, dollar price floor, but negative pricing can enable operators to economically dispatch down plants that have varying negative supply offers. This becomes a little bit more important when there's um, multiple different kind, uh, sites of variable renewables that may have um, zero or negative prices and we need to figure out which ones to dispatch. So probably not quite happening yet in Alberta. Um, that also boosts the investment signal for storage. Um, so that's an important reason as well. Um, allowing higher scarcity pricing and considering an operating reserve demand curve can help. Um, coordinating natural gas and electricity market timing. There's a fair amount of natural gas, of course, in Alberta and ensuring that those time, the markets are timed in a way that uh, can enable that natural gas to operate as flexibly as it can shorter uh, market settlement periods, as Cheryl was mentioning at the beginning, um, and then, of course, enabling all the resources to participate, um, including things like storage that don't always look like generation or transmission. So um, some markets in North America and in the United States have looked at creating special products um, as kind of an entry point way for storage to be able to participate. And finally, where you know we don't have high scarcity pricing, as Jacob was mentioning as well, creating some specific products for things like fast frequency response and other kinds of flexibility-oriented products can also help. So that was a, a tour of some options, but happy to dig in some more. That's great, Sonia. I wanted to pick up on uh, one of the things you mentioned, um, and maybe Cheryl, you can comment a little bit more in detail about that, um, the idea of the uh, shorter settlement periods. Um, so Cheryl, if you could, if you could speak a little bit to, you know, what are the benefits, but also the costs of shortening uh, the settlement periods? Um, you know, currently Alberta settles on an hourly basis uh, with intra or deviation settled out of market. Um, so what, what would we want to think about if we, if we think about moving there? Well, as I said at the beginning, I'm a big believer that the energy price has to respect what it reflect what it actually takes to keep the lights on and ideally in as granular a way as possible. And about five years ago, FERC did a um, comprehensive look at price formation in the energy market to look at what were the potential weaknesses in the energy markets that were keeping them. And this is in the six markets that FERC oversees, not, we, FERC does not oversee IRCA, that might be keeping them from fully reflecting what it keeps to take the lights on. And one of the three that uh, they decided to proceed with was making sure that the dispatch period, which was every five minutes, matched the settlement period. And the importance of that was because if those are the dispatch intervals that you usually run the system, that you actually use to run the system, then if the price is also set in those intervals, then if the price goes up in a particular interval, you can use the market rather than out of market uplift to send a signal of what's needed, which could be very important for storage, for fast peaking units, um, potentially fast acting demand response, or other resources that you need to balance variable renewables, sometimes rather rapidly. Um, and if the if it's all kind of averaged out like peanut butter at the end of the hour, all the five minute periods, then the market isn't actually setting the accurate, um, the accurate signal of what it takes to keep the lights on. And a resource that might really benefit from those peaky periods won't be rewarded and incentivized in the market. But I also think it's closely related to scarcity pricing. Um, I believe, agree with what others have said that I think the energy market price should rise to whatever the marginal balancing resource is in that specific period. This is something we've seen in ERCOT where they function for a long time without a capacity market by being showing a lot of fortitude about letting the scarcity pricing be what it is so that it'll send the investment signal. And I think given the current situation that Alberta is focused on of abandoning all the work it's done to plan a capacity market, they've given up that potential insurance policy for having resource adequacy there for the future. So they have to look at, okay, within the markets that the Alberta ESO does run, 
where are those insurance policies going to lie? And fast settlements are part of, I think, making sure the energy market sends those signals. And although they were um, a lot of work for, I believe four of the market operators in the US didn't already have the five minute settlements when FERC ordered that in 2016. But although it was a lot of work, it was politically one of the less controversial. It, it seemed to attract a lot less political heat than changing the offer caps, which attracted a lot of agita and um, uplift allocation, which led into kind of a miasma of discussion. Um, it seemed rather, um, a crisp thing that could be done that could actually make the market work better. Thanks, thanks, Cheryl. I, I want to get into the price and offer caps as well as the floor um, shortly and, and the general discussion of scarcity pricing and, and Jacob, I'll loop, loop you in at that point to bring up some um, experience in terms of the operating uh, the ORDC uh, in Texas. But before there, you know, we talked about shortening settlement periods as one way to demonstrate value and flexibility and and um, increasingly needed. But Frank, I, I'm going to put you on the spot again here. Uh, this is a, your question coming in um, from Andrew. So, you know, Cheryl in her opening statement mentioned LMPs for Alberta. You've mentioned this as well. Um, I guess relative to looking at scarcity pricing and, and, um, and changing price caps, how important for Alberta is looking at locational marginal pricing, whether it be nodal or zonal, as well as the day ahead market uh, for setting up the, the unit commitment uh, with advance notice. How important are those two measures uh, as compared to re revisiting what our price bounds are? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, 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 depending on the level of uh, forward contracting uh, uh, or energy that you have, uh, you can run an offer, you can run a short-term market with an extremely low offer cap. It just requires a lot of contracting for energy. Uh, but um, so that, that, that I think in terms of making the most efficient use of the resources that you have, um, particularly if what you're interested in is scaling up the amount of renewables, then uh, essentially having the ability to have a day ahead market where you can adjust the schedules uh, people submit for all 24 hours a day at once and you get a schedule that respects startup and no load cost and other non-convexities with how the generation operates. All those things become much, much more important in a world in which you have a lot of intermittent renewables which are essentially subjecting the dispatchable resources to a lot of uncertainty so that uh, the day ahead market can allow those resources to plan uh, for what's likely to occur in real time with respect to the intermittent renewables. So, you know, I, I guess I think of the having a day ahead market uh, is very useful if you have the very, uh, uh, it, you have an interest in a lot of intermittent resources to give you that ability uh, to be responsive. The other thing that it does is it gives you the ability to have demand participate on equal footing with supply uh, in real time, largely because demand can buy energy in the day ahead market that it does not consume in real time and thereby sell it back at the real time price uh, and be able to benefit from the fact that it is uh, reducing its consumption. If you have a single settlement system and you try to do a demand response, you're typically going to have to come up with some way uh, to set a baseline relative to which you'd like people to reduce, which has a whole host of problems uh, that you get into. Whereas if you have two settlement a day ahead real time, uh, then demand can do the same thing that supply can do in the sense of schedule day ahead, not consume or consume more. Uh, and in that sense, participate uh, in the, um, the, the market. And finally, the other thing that a day ahead market can do is allow you to co-optimize the procurement of energy and ancillary services. And if what you're doing is having an increasing amount of intermittent renewables, having the ability to co-optimize energy and ancillary services can significantly reduce the cost of keeping the lights on uh, in a world with a lot of intermittent renewables. Okay. I just have a quick follow-up coming in from, from the uh, attendees. 
you, you mentioned contracting. Is there an energy only market or deregulated market that requires all load or a substantial amount of load to forward contract? Um, not in the United States, but certainly in Latin America, there are quite a few. So for example, the early Colombian market had a contracting mandate, the but Brazilian market has a contracting mandate, the Chilean market has a contracting mandate. These are, are ways that these, uh, these countries manage to uh, keep the lights on and continue to have load growth. Uh, it, it's it's uh, it's a it's a way to essentially ensure an alternative way I'd argue to ensure long term uh, resource adequacy if you have forward contracts far enough out into the future uh, for a significant amount of energy then there is the revenue stream there is the obligation of generators to be there uh, you can keep the lights on uh, with fairly modest prices simply because you've committed everyone to uh, to supply energy in the short-term market. Okay, thanks. Sarah? So we also have a question coming in about Texas, um, which is often a, a favored comparison with Alberta. Um, Jacob, I'd like to, to ask you to get a little into a little bit um, administratively set operating uh, reserve demand curves. If you can tell us a little bit more about how they work um, the experience with them, you know, for example, in the Texas market, and then, you know, if there are other things that you think uh, are lessons from Texas that are important to, to pull out, maybe you could speak to that as well. Yeah, so I, I, I think as, as has been mentioned, Texas is uh, unique in the United States in terms of its willingness to allow prices to, to go up to, in Texas's case, $9,000 a megawatt hour. This is uh, several times the uh, the, for example, the offer cap in the other FERC jurisdictional markets was just raised to 2000. So uh, this allows prices to go significantly higher. And uh, the way this is uh, operationalized is through uh, a sloped operating reserves demand curve. So in principle, the idea is that instead of where most markets, uh, you have a fixed uh, requirement for operating reserves, uh, and then you might uh, reach a price cap if you fail to uh, hold that quantity of reserves on the system. Instead, the ORDC is trying to uh, estimate the value of holding additional reserves on the system. So the value is not gonna drop to zero immediately. Uh, so this has a, a couple benefits from a market design standpoint. One is that uh, you can actually maintain offer caps uh, without having a price cap. So generators don't need to be bidding $9,000 a megawatt hour, uh, but you can still reach a price of $9,000 a megawatt hour if the, uh, if the reserves run short. Uh, a second advantage is uh, in terms of the, the long-term contracting, you have full strength spot prices on, based on which uh, people can settle those forward contracts. Uh, so that creates some coherence in terms of uh, the, the resource adequacy requirements. Uh, and then lastly, uh, kind of echoing something that Sonia said, uh, having those high prices uh, does invite a lot of the latent demand response in the system to uh, activate. So uh, a lot of participants on the demand side might not have the wherewithal to be bidding actively in the markets, but they might just be able to see the price rise as a result of the ORDC and uh, drop off the system because of that high price. Yeah. Thanks, Jacob. Um, it's a good segue into discussion around price caps and offer caps where we wanted to go. And a reminder to attendees, um, feel free to write in your questions. We see them coming in and we're going to try to get to them. Um, I'll, I'll kick this off by um, uh, relaying a question from, from Brian here online. He's recounting uh, earlier this year, the weather on January 15th, in Alberta was 30 below Celsius. And for our American friends, that's not too far off from th negative 30 Fahrenheit. Uh, and there was no wind. Uh, it was a cloudy day. Uh, and we also had coal plants tripping offline and demand set an all-time peak record of uh, 11,000 and roughly 700 megawatts. Um, power prices spiked to about 70 cents per kilowatt hour in several hours, uh, hit the peak of 99 cents. In fact, I think it might have even hit the... Um, price cap of a uh, dollar or thousand dollars a megawatt hour. Fortunately, there were no power outages. Does this cause a concern? So this is sort of the general 
what we would probably expect in a, in a high demand and, and short supply, situ short term situation. Is this a cause for concern that we are rising up to the price gap or is this normal functioning of an energy market? Frank, you're shaking your head, so I'm gonna let you take that and I think we shared an answer. Um, I will un unmute you. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, th this is what, it, 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 I mean, I, the, I guess the way that I would describe it is, is that if you want the mouse to keep looking for the cheese, you gotta let them eat it every now and then. And, you know, so the, the idea is that, yes, it does need to hit the offer cap every now and then, or load can, can, can curtail. Uh, this is fairly, uh, to take another example of a similar market in Australia, they, I think, have the world record offer cap of about 14,000 Australian dollars in a few half hours every year or every few years, it, it hits that offer cap. And that's what gives everyone the incentive to, in that market, uh, hedge. And it also gives a strong incentive for the generators to be online uh, when that offer cap gets hit. So that is you know, that is precisely, you know, what, what we would expect to happen. The, the problem is, is if it happens extremely frequently, that's, that's the, the problem, but not that it happens. It should happen with sufficient uh, frequency to make, the, make the, the sorts of things that we'd like to see happen. Yeah, there's a, there's a great question coming in uh, from the audience. I'm gonna put this here right now. Isn't there a bit of a catch-22 between raising the price cap or introducing an ORDC to try to get demand response when these high prices will lead to loads forward hedging to avoid the risk, thereby reducing or eliminating demand response in real time? Oh, no, no, no. I mean, that's a, that's a great question and a great point. It's, it's that it's, it's all about how much can I flexibly, can I reduce with ease versus how much, you know, to, to give the example, if my demand is 100, um, I should probably hedge uh, 95 of it if I only think that five is what I could reduce if asked to reduce. So I'd, I'd hedge that 95 and the five that I can reduce, I'd put that on the spot market and be prepared to reduce uh, if, if uh, the price goes sufficiently high. So that's precisely what we'd like people to do is hedge up to what you know you need and then leave open and uh, what you think you can be flexible on. And that's, that's, that's uh, how markets work. And that's what we would like to have happen. Yeah, no, it's a great, uh, it's a, it is a great question. Sonia, I'm gonna hit you in one second. Um, the, the notion here is we could mandate forward contracting to get to some sufficient level and resolve the reliability externality that way, or by allowing prices to rise, you're gonna naturally induce that. So uh, it was a very good question. Sonia, you had something you wanted to say. Um, I just wanted to come in and, and quickly address perhaps what might underlie that question to you around just um, consumer protections and sort of the um, cost of uh, high scarcity pricing. Um, our, our team did an analysis a few years ago of um, ERCOT's higher scarcity pricing than in other uh, markets in the US at least. So they have an, a, a cap of about $9,000 with an ORDC as well. Um, and it's just, you know, I think the point that we need to focus on is that the number of times per year that we're getting anywhere close to this um, cap are relatively small. So sometimes it can make headlines and that can cause a lot of, um, you know, uh, consternation for market operators as well as policymakers. Um, but it's really important to think about what are the average prices for customers over the entire year and are we spending more by having, um, you know, alternative reliability payments, or are we spending more by having these higher scarcity price prices? And um, we found that uh, at least in ERCOT, um, comparing with kind of payments that would look like the way that other markets uh, pay for capacity and capacity markets, if, if ERCOT had that instated, they would have spent um, you know, between four and five billion additional dollars on uh, energy and capacity than they did with their higher scarcity pricing. So that's just something to mention because I think um, people get nervous about the cost for customers, but 
it's really about um, about the annual average and oftentimes with higher scarcity pricing you really get lower annual average costs. Thanks, Sonia. And that's, that actually is uh, a really interesting point in this question of sort of what's the protecting consumers from costs on one side, but also then, you know, what, what are they avoiding on the other? Um, I'd like to follow up on that, you know, with you or maybe Cheryl also um, from that vein of, so, so if such an approach of having, you know, higher price caps can actually be better for consumers, are there still tools that we need to think about implementing just to make sure that there isn't a large downside risk and, you know, what would you be kind of looking out for? So maybe, Sonia, if you have anything else you wanted to add to that and then I'll turn it over to Cheryl. Uh, Go ahead, Cheryl, yeah. I well, when FERC uh, ordered the increase in the offer caps from a um, thousand to two thousand, which of course is considerably much more modest than ERCOT, as has been pointed out. Um, they put in place protections such as the market monitors having to look at the components of any time it went above the previous thousand um, dollar cap to make sure that it was cost based and there wasn't market power. And I do think there's a market power trade off if you have a higher cap in any market that has to be considered. But I just think generally there are trade-offs in any market design. And the biggest reality is to be honest about those trade-offs. There's a tendency, um, there's always a loud voice and appropriately concerned about cost to customers. So when you're talking about a capacity market, it's like, oh my goodness, look at all that money for customers. We don't want that, it's too much money for customers. It's like, and so then, well then the trade-off is you have to have higher um, caps and allow scarcity pricing and allow opportunities to for the cost of running the system to come in in other ways in the times when it does and when you're saying no to one thing that might seem attractive then you go to design those alternative mechanisms and you hear the same voices saying oh my goodness that's so expensive we could never handle that that's exposing customers too much and the trade-off that you made is forgotten and I think um, being realistic that there's no free lunch in one way or the other, there has to be an opportunity to recover the cost of keeping the system running in the future is just really important. Frank? Yeah, I, I, the big point I wanted to emphasize is, is that if there is, uh, if there is adequate hedging by loads, then the, the fact that uh, prices spike is really just uh, money going back and forth between the generators that are short versus the generators that are long. And to the extent that people have purchased their power in advance, um, th th those prices will tend to be uh, fairly reasonable, not the lowest possible they can be, but certainly reasonable. Why? Well, if you're purchasing energy to be delivered two to three years in the future, you're allowing uh, competition between existing resources and potential entrants that is going to discipline the sorts of prices that you're going to get. And so the big issue is planning ahead in, in, in terms of this procurement. And, and that is what's and, and that's what's going to essentially protect consumers uh, if they are adequately hedged, planning ahead and adequate hedging. And most of that price volatility will be going to the entities we'd like it to go to, which are the generators to uh, make sure to keep their units on during the periods we'd really like them to be there. Hmm. This sort of speaks to some of the comments made by I think all of you at the outset about efficient allocation of risk and getting you know, the portion of demand that can participate and respond active um, and those that cannot protected. Uh, there's one question here and Cheryl, you touched on, um, you know, potential market power in Alberta's smaller size. So the question is, are there special considerations or tack on mechanisms prompted by Alberta's relatively small and relatively isolated electricity system or market for context for those aren't, who aren't as, don't follow Alberta's market as much as we do. We peak at around 11,000 as you saw, average load around eight or 9,000 megawatts. And we have an intertie capacity with our two neighboring provinces in Montana that sums up to you know, rounding about a about thousand megawatts or 10% of peak. Um, so relatively isolated system and, and relatively concentrated in terms of generation ownership. Um, so combined with Alberta's volatile economy, making demand growth uncertain, does it just mean a natural unavoidable orientation towards smaller, less lumpy, but possibly more costly dollar per megawatt generating units? So that's, I guess, a market structure question, but 
Moreover, do we have more concerns about market power um, in our smaller isolated market that requires us to think a little differently than maybe the US experience? Well, maybe I'll start and let people who are more familiar with Alberta chime in. I think any market has to be concerned about market power. And um, that's why independent market monitors exist. But I would think the relative relatively linear nature of the Alberta market with like a lot of the fossil in one place and a lot of the wind in another place might actually be an asset for detecting market power because it, it's somewhat straightforward. It's not like there's going to be hidden congestion zones where somebody has uh, power and is not perceived that have to be very um, picked up by very subtle screens. It seems you should be able to keep an eye on those dual ends of the system, but I do think market power has to be a consideration in how the market is operated. Anybody else want to chime in on market power considerations specific to Alberta? Frank? Nope. Oh. Me. Thank you. Oh, well, I, I would just say there, there certainly is a long history in the Alberta market with respect to this, this sort of uh, issue of market power and how much is too much. Um, and I guess the point that I would make is I do think it's quite important, as I mentioned in my opening statement, that there be an explicit market power mitigation mechanism in place just simply because otherwise you're always in this world of you know my market power is your superior business acumen and we never really resolve it because fundamentally it is a uh, sort of legal administrative determination as to whether someone is exercising market power so if you have in place a market power mitigation mechanism that you have stakeholdered and and done all the things necessary so people understand in a transparent manner when they will be mitigated for the things that they might do i think that's the that's the way to uh, address the issue i think it's it's worked you know pretty well in in all the u.s markets in the sense that most of the uh, market participants have pretty much reconciled themselves to, okay, if these system conditions arise, I can't uh, exercise market power. I'm okay with that. I'll optimize against what the, that mechanism is and I'll be fine. Sarah, do you want to? Uh, yeah, so I wanted to turn things over. We had an, another question that came in that I think is an interesting um, sort of general question on market design as we look at a very high renewable energy future. So Jacob, I was hoping you could um, start us off there. Uh, so the question is, is if you have 100% renewable energy, the short run marginal cost of an additional megawatt hour is always zero. And this type of market produces no revenue for producers. What should replace this paradigm in such a system? So I think that you know the question of sort of as we look to really shifting, and it looks like Frank also has some ideas here. So a good good question for us to um, to to come into, and I'll I'll let Jacob you you start off. Sure. So I, I think that uh, to start, I would say that if you look at the models of of even entirely decarbonized systems, it's very rare that you see literally 100% renewables. So uh, typically there's some thermal systems uh, still on the system, uh, potentially with carbon capture. So it's, it's not all zero marginal cost resources. But, uh, but the other thing is that if you think literally about running a system with 100% renewable, uh, variable renewable, uh, with zero marginal cost, inevitably you'd need to have some demand side participation and some storage in those markets. And uh, so you'll get the price being set by the uh, marginal value to load that's on the system or the marginal value or the opportunity cost for storage resources that are on the system. Uh, so you'll get uh, high prices uh, set by uh, the, that side of the market. And then, uh, and then as a backstop, you can also uh, think about the uh, procurement of ancillary services, which will entirely change in a system like that. Uh, where you need to have uh, reserves uh, that are related to the probability of running out of uh, weather dependent resources and running into a scarcity situation. And so uh, your willingness to procure reserves on a system like that uh, will have a price attached to it and uh, enable price formation of, above zero uh, in uh, of, of enough hours of the year for, for it to be a meaningful signal. 
Thanks, Jacob. Are there others that wanted to um, add to that? I wanted to chime in. I think that um, the phenomenon of how you compensate the cost of keeping the lights on in a very, very high renewable uh, market is really leading to a lot of creativity and how we just fundamentally think of paying for electricity. We've just taken it for granted that it's a volumetric energy project, pro, a volumetric product, you know, would just like telecom used to be a volumetric product and you make money on energy and you make money on peak. But as more and more resources come in that have completely different cost curves, we need to really think of to the extent you need other resources to balance the system, how do you pay them? And it might not be on volumetric energy. California is already exemplifying this where they have their daytime peak is gone and the resources right now largely gas peakers but some storage and pump storage that they need in the evening ramp they're not going to be able to just pay through energy prices and so they're looking at other mechanisms um iso new england i'm not here on their behalf but i know they're doing a lot of work right now because they're looking at an increasingly energy constrained future with reserve markets and um, day ahead reserve markets to try to make sure that there's other mechanisms to pay the resources that you need to balance in that high renewable scenario in the future. So I do think we'll see more focus on ancillary services or res especially reserve markets or other types of payment for things. Uh, payment, we've seen ramping markets in California and the mid-continent ISO, other types of payments that we didn't need before when we had mostly fuel-based um, resources whose costs really were volumetrically proportional and so the energy prices on volume were quite fine. I'm, I'm going to ask a follow-up. Oh, Frank, you can jump oh, in first. I, I, I only wanted to emphasize that this, this, this zero marginal cost resource world is nothing new. Um, this is, uh, it, there are many hydro systems around the world that have positive prices virtually all hours of the year for precisely the reasons that Jacob mentioned, which is, you know, you've got storage and you've got a finite amount of energy behind that dam that has an opportunity cost you're going to offer in at a price that reflects that opportunity cost and storage is going to take place and, and, uh, and so prices are going to fluctuate within the realm that's determined by these dynamic considerations. And in a world with intermittent renewables, it's, it's exactly the, the same thing. It's just that on a shorter time horizon, and whereas in the case of, uh, of the uh, hydro resource, it's a seasonal issue, but in the case of uh, intermittent wind and solar, it's going to be a daily per or a per maybe shorter horizon situation. And so, yeah, you may occasionally see some very low prices, but you'll also see some very high prices to get people to, st to, to essentially store. So it's not, I don't think, any real fundamental difference um, although it is true that, that there will be the need to develop, as is the case in California, some uh, more ancillary services to deal with the fast ramps, but that's, again, anticipated and fits right into the existing ancillary services market. Well, let's go there. There's a great question, uh, and keep the questions coming in, by the way. We've got a, a queue of them, and they're, and they're really helpful. Uh, this is from Joe. And he says, so Sonia specifically called out the need to increase system flexibility, both from existing and new resources. Not all resources are equally flexible. My question is what, if any, trade-offs are there in trying to accommodate the least flexible existing resources versus incentivizing new, more flexible resources? I would add a, a follow-on to that. Cheryl, you mentioned California as an example of coming up with a suite of different products and procuring them directly um, to what extent do we need to be looking at delineating or separating out individual flexibility products uh, versus, you know, using the, the energy market to, uh, with perhaps shorter time settlement periods and whatnot, and then scarcity pricing um, to incentivize that same flexibility? What are the trade-offs between those two uh, angles? So, I mean, I'll start with you, Cheryl, and, and then Sonia. Well, I think the advantage of supplementing an energy market with more refined ancillary services markets like ramping and reserve can um, help zero in on exactly what you think you need as you begin to refine those um, models and give yourself a little bit of a belt and suspenders from just assuming that the energy market will produce it. 
um, all of the markets are adapting to how they're going to operate the system in a climate constrained world. And uh, I think there's a, a little bit gets into politics, but there's a issue with um, there's a perception that rather than just paying everything as vanilla energy, there might be a need to, co to compensate attributes like fast ramping um, that resources have, but there's going to be winners and losers in that system. And what we've seen certainly in the U.S. markets is that um, resources are um, vehemently arguing for con compensation of attributes that they might offer. The most prominent being the Department of Energy proposal in the U.S. to pay extra money to anyone that had 90 days of coal on site because they had that offered a attribute. It wasn't necessarily the attribute that FERC found the system was calling for at that point. So I think there's going to be a need to um, really be grounded in what reliability and customers need in the cacophony of voices to pay different attributes. But I personally believe supplementing with refining ancillary services is a good idea in the future. Okay. Sonia, did you want to comment on this market for flexibility? Sure, yeah. So um, I think it's a really interesting question um, because I think I really see them as um, two ends of a spectrum of how to deal with this changing world. So one end is really work on the energy market design and really ensure that, you know, the scarcity prices are in, uh, allowed to get high enough and, you know, um, all resources really don't face barriers to entry to the market. Um, and I think that you will find that um, flexibility is elicited in that situation. Of course, it also includes, you know, Joe was talking about the inflexible resources and how to um, integrate those or how to sort of manage the system around those. Um, well, if the prices vary enough, I think they will at least be economically incented to operate as flexibly as they can, um, as well as, you know, eliciting additional resources to come in. Um, but sort of on the other end of the spectrum is, you know, um, the kind of approach where uh, more oversight of regulators and kind of oversight of market operators is desired. And there's more of kind of the, um, you know, approach of trying to put together a mix of resources that really gives us confidence over the long term that we can ensure lights stay on and that, um, you know, reliability is sort of perhaps more expensive in that scenario, but there's a little bit more certainty that um, the, the resources will be available to keep the, the system in place. So that's kind of the worldview where you have more flexibility products that perhaps you're procuring over different time frames, um, and that is complementing the energy market that may have a lower scarcity price or, or something like that. Um, but I think it comes down to a lot of questions that there's no easy answer to and and it's actually, you know, different people just have a different view on, you know, how big of a risk is political interference in markets. Um, how much do we expect the real world to behave like theory suggests that it will, um, you know, these types of questions, I think, underlie the um, kind of uh, ends of the spectrum that say, you know, design the energy market well, let scarcity prices rise as high as they can versus the ones where, um, you know, you might create more flexibility products to have a little bit more of a view on what kind of resource mix you're wanting to end up with. Okay, so, this, is, this is a good set of views. I know, Frank, you're going to go on, you wanted to chat about um, ramping. I just want to bring in this question because it's related. Uh, to what extent does five minute dispatch and settlement reduce the need for some of the ancillary service markets uh, or their prices? Would that reduction be offset by fast ramping services or could the total price for energy and ancillary services drop? So I guess this is um, really honing in on the trade off between shortening the, the settlement period on uh, energy products and the need for other ancillary services. I don't know if you can relate to that in your answer, Frank. Sure. Um... Yeah, so he, here's here's the basic challenge. I mean, the, the point that I would make is the is the following of, of this this general principle for the design of the answer services, which is you want to design the set of products that the system operator requires for reliable grid operation. 
Um, and certainly one of the big benefits of more frequent settlement is simply the fact that you can reduce the demand for ancillary service. Simple way to think about it is, is that your single contingency within a five minute interval is likely to be much, much smaller than your contingency within an entire uh, hour period. So if you're dispatching units on a five minute basis, you can, as opposed to calling on reserves, you can just simply dispatch a generation unit uh, to meet an increment of demand within the five minute interval. So in that sense, you certainly can uh, reduce the uh, demand uh, for uh, ancillary services through doing that. But the other point is just to notice that in fitting into this point is that here is a graph, what I have here is a graph of the net load in California for a representative day. And the thing that this is, is a result of the amount of renewables on the system, we've created this a very fast ramp that no longer exists. And so precisely fitting in with the point that I just talked about of design the ancillary services to address the reliability problems that the system operator faces, that system operator is going to need to be able to meet that fast ramp of 10,000 megawatts. And in order to do that, it's going to need to skip over the bids of a lot of thermal resources early in the day, but make sure that they're going to be around with unloaded capacity to hit that ramp as we move into hours 16 to 19. So uh, what, the, what the fast ramp product does is essentially says, look, if I'm gonna skip your bid in the dispatch, uh, then what I'm gonna do is compensate you for the opportunity cost that you would get from selling energy by the fact that your bid price is less than the energy price during that period of the day when I don't need you uh, to compensate you for being there when I do need you. So it, it is the case that as you put more of these uh, intermittent resources on the system, there will be new reliability challenges that come about. The, the, the reliability challenge that California faces, this fast ramp challenge, as well as another one is the so-called uh, keeping uh, what's called pay for performance, which is making sure that the res units providing regulation are actually going to the set points that they're supposed to go through within the, the various intervals that they're going. So, you know, it, this will necessitate the creation of additional ancillary services because of the new reliability challenges that come about. But you know, it, it, it should not be technology specific, it should be service specific to the system operator. So for example, one of the resources that provide a lot of this fast ramping product are batteries because they can discharge so fast, but you know, there isn't a specific battery discharge service, there is just simply this fast ramp service. And that is the way to increase competition in this ancillary services market that you would like to do it. Thank you. Sarah? Great. Well, thanks, Frank. And um, you, you mentioned batteries. I'd like to, we have a couple of questions about storage, and I think that's a great place for us to kind of explore how these different market approaches that we've been talking about would actually apply to a specific new technology like storage. So there were a couple of folks asking um, about, uh, you know, the, the link kind of between negative pricing and storage assets. Frank, you just touched on the, on the ramping period. Um, so I guess I'll throw this one out to, to whoever kind of wants to, to chime in. You know, how do you think about market design in a way that, um, you know, enables this innovation to happen and maybe in particular applied to storage? You know, how do you see those different elements that we've talked about uh, either encouraging or as, as Sonia, as you were saying, actually allow removing some of those barriers to entry and, and what else needs to be done to enable that? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer. Go for I mean, it, Frank, and whoever else wants okay, to jump in. Okay, sorry, I, I didn't yeah, know no. who you were talking to, but I mean, the, 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 that, that to me is the, is the big uh, point about why you do want more frequent, that more frequent settlement is useful, why a day ahead market is useful, why a locational pricing is useful. Let me just give an example with storage. I mean, where would I prefer to have storage is probably within the uh, uh, region inside a load pocket. Um, if what I'm doing is pricing energy locationally, 
that storage will be benefiting from the fact that it is seeing a higher price in the periods in which there's congestion and perhaps the same price in periods when they're not, it will be rewarded for its location because of locational pricing. So I, I think that, that, that the fact that we uh, price both temporally and spatially um, is going to be beneficial to storage, to load participation. That's also where the two settlement system comes in to bring in the uh, ability of load uh, to participate in the same way as generation in providing uh, megawatts, so to speak, of demand reductions, which is the same thing as supply increases in, in real time and profiting the same way a generator would profit from supplying additional energy. Uh, it, it could profit from supplying less demand because it sold whatever it sold in the day ahead market and doesn't consume it, which is effectively the same as saying it's supplied that amount of megawatts. So both the spatial and temporal pricing is going to be very beneficial to getting these new technologies in. Um, Jacob, I just wanna follow up with you here. There's a question from the audience. Is there any caution or advice you'd provide to the Alberta market around exploring negative prices while still ensuring cost recovery for generators and long-term adequacy? Do, 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 you, do you fear that uh, lowering the price floor from zero to allowing it to go negative is a, is a threat to uh, long-term adequacy? Uh, I don't think so. I, I think that the uh, what should guide us is the is the physics of the system and the actual cost to to provide the next unit of electricity. And uh, you can uh, see uh, in markets with with nodal pricing that transmission congestion will lead to to negative prices from time to time, and and that's the efficient price at that time and place. So uh, that to me is is the right uh, price to set and the right way to incentivize uh, resources in the long term. Uh, I think we've we've discussed uh, leading up to this that uh, I would expect a lot of generators to be hedged uh, in advance, and so hopefully they've managed that uh, that risk uh, associated with the potential for negative prices. Yeah, no great response. <laughs> um, you know, here's here's one kind of taking a step back from this discussion. Somebody asks, I'll click answer. Um, if Alberta currently has resource adequacy, and we do have quite a hefty supply cushion at the moment, and average prices are approximately reflecting long-run marginal costs at the moment, does Alberta necessarily need market power mitigation? This is a question coming in. Um, who would like to take that one? Jacob. Uh, well, so I, I think that it's, um, it's a surprise to have uh, long, average prices that are high enough to sustain adequate capacity and a price cap of $1,000. And I think this is connected to the uh, lack of uh, uh, mitigation of offers in, in the real-time markets in, Al in Alberta. So to me, I think the big risk there is if you permit uh, generators to be offering at uh, significantly above their actual costs, uh, you could be sacrificing short-term efficiency and actually be running the system uh, less efficiently than you could be otherwise. Uh, so I think there, there is uh, still an argument to be made for uh, market power mitigation in, in that setting, uh, just in the sense that uh, it offers you the, the ability to get a better sense of the true costs of running the system and, and uh, operate it more efficiently. Sure. Uh, Frank, you raise your hand. Yeah, I was just going to say it's not always going to be the case that you have adequate supply and what you're putting in place is a mechanism to deal with all possible sets of circumstances. And so what you really want to do is make the call as to say, this is, if you like, uh, what is uh, will lead to mitigation and it will lead to mitigation regardless of the supply demand balance. And a simple way to see it is, is is even if you have a lot of capacity in a system, if most a lot of that capacity is owned by a few firms, you, even if you have excess capacity, you still have a market power problem. So uh, what you're doing is making sure that under all possible circumstances, what you deem to be excessive amounts of market power can't be exercised. You're not saying you shouldn't be able to get uh, scarcity, you shouldn't be able to get the other things that uh, we would think could, could potentially happen, but it's just these are, the, this, 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 the beyond this level, we uh, deem it not acceptable and will subject you to mitigation. 
I completely agree. And I think you have to be careful about assuming just because something has worked out in the past under a different set of resources that you that will carry over and therefore should inform how you design the future when the mix could be very different with very different characteristics. Sarah, Anya? One, one quick thought there. Um, we've observed that um, when energy systems are in transition, there can be short run times of uh, oversupply and that it really does tend toward short term oversupply, but we expect that over the longer term as the energy as the as the resource mix transitions that oversupply goes away and it is really important for us to be thinking about that longer term horizon so just agreeing with what others have been saying but thinking about what's the resource mix that we really need to maintain reliability and mitigate market power once that oversupply um, kind of shorter term oversupply situation is behind us so we're uh, coming actually close to the, the time for our wrap-up question, but before we do that, I'd like to um, kind of bring us up and we've talked about uh, a lot of different mechanisms. So for contracting or DCs, shorter settlement periods, uh, price floors and caps. Um, I'd love to hear from really everybody, I guess, um, about what are your, you know, what are your preferred tools, but maybe even more so, how do they interact? Is this about picking, you know, one that is sort of leading the way? Is it about combining them? Are there ones that work well together or don't work well together? What should we be thinking about as we, as we are evaluating these different tools? Um, I can call on someone or if someone wants to jump in to go first to... Frank, why don't, we, why don't we start off with you and we'll kind of go around. Sure, sure. No, I mean, I guess what I would say is market, the market design is, is an integrated process. In other words, you got to make it's uh, what you're doing in market design is very analogous to trying to put a balloon in the box. And if you're trying to put the balloon in the box, you need to design the box completely to, to encapsulate the balloon. So, you know, for, for, from my perspective, you know, if, if what your if what your goal is 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 to benefit consumers with the least the lowest possible price consistent with long term system reliability, then effectively, you know that that's going to I think uh, really tell you to rely on pricing and efficient pricing and and that is spatially that is temporally. Um, and then the other is, is that you, you also want to make sure that you have the resources that you need to operate the system and you have therefore uh, created a long term uh, resource adequacy mechanism that gets that uh, energy into the market. Um, and it, I think the important emphasis now, if you are serious about going to a lot of intermittent renewables is get that energy uh, capacity starts to lose its meaning as you have more and more uh, intermittent renewables. And so thinking in terms of mechanisms to making sure that that energy uh, actually is delivered, that's where I think forward contracting far in advance and if there is going to be a regulatory intervention, it would be in terms of making mandates on contracting levels um, to, to ensure that the lights will stay on on a, on a system-wide basis. Thanks, Pink. Uh, Sonia, what, what are your thoughts on kind of putting all these mechanisms together? Um, well, I would say, first of all, I totally agree with what Frank was just saying around um, how capacity does start to lose its meaning as the energy mix changes. Um, and so uh, really paying attention to getting the energy market right um, seems like a great direction for Albert. And it sounds like that's exactly the direction uh, folks are going. So that's really exciting. Um, I also thought I would just uh, mention that paying close attention to the resource adequacy construct that is kind of uh, underlying some of these um, uh, planning oriented conversations is really important as the energy mix changes too because of exactly that point that Frank was mentioning that capacity um, just is not always an adequate uh, way of thinking about resource adequacy as uh, more variable renewables come online and flexibility is um, more required. So paying close attention to the resource adequacy definitions and kind of thinking about that uh, will really help with reliability in the medium and long term, I think. Thanks, Sonia. Cheryl? 
Well, I agree with everything that's been said. I think that um, as Frank observed, the markets are all integrated. You've already taken one market off the table, which is a capacity market. And um, looking forward, every other tool has to be considered because of the amount of change you're going through. But, you know, like they say, why did you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Most of the money is in the energy market right now. And I would say focus on getting that um, temporally, locationally, granularly right to the best of your ability, and then secondarily turn to refining ancillary services. And I, I guess I'm closing. So the uh, I, I think I'm echoing a lot of, of what has been said and saying that you can't go wrong with having uh, prices defined as granularly as you can and as accurately as, as you can. Uh, which in the US means five minutes uh, and, and at the nodal uh, level. Um, and uh, the, the only thing I would, I would uh, emphasize with respect to, to Cheryl's last comment is that also if you have co-optimized ancillary services and, and energy products, the way you define the ancillary service products will, will in turn affect the energy prices as well and, uh, and, and make sure that we have uh, efficient signals in, in both of those markets. Uh, so I, I think uh, I can I can just mostly endorse what what has been said by the others. Okay, well, we're we're approaching near the end, and our attrition rate has been pretty good. Only uh, <laughs> we've had 120 people on here, and only four have dropped off. So I'd say that's pretty promising for a Tuesday morning talking about electricity markets. Uh, I only have one final question, and you may have just touched on it, but it's a chance to you know drive it home one more time. So I'll go around the horn in just 30 seconds each. You know, what if you could offer one single piece of advice uh, to the ASO who is making recommendations or ultimately to the government on, on what we should be doing about our electricity market, if anything, here in, in Alberta? Um, what single piece of advice might you offer? And um, I'll start with you, Frank, in the middle there. Um, I, the <laughs> I, 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 what single, I mean, yeah, it's hard. again, I guess I, I, my point would be is if you're going to have a finite offer cap, you do need a long-term resource adequacy mechanism. Thinking in terms of, of, of a long-term resource adequacy mechanism, take a very broad view. Uh, think about how can I do this in such a way, at least my argument would be is to capture as much of the benefits of market mechanisms, yet still give me the confidence as the regulator that the lights will stay on. Because one of the things I think is, is important to bear in mind is there is no one single entity in the wholesale market regime who can be blamed if the lights go out. Everyone has the ability to point the finger. Whereas in the former vertically integrated regime, you just went to the vertically integrated utility, that was it. And so what that tells me is the regulator needs to recognize that difference and make sure that they have prepared uh, adequately to ensure that the lights won't go out uh, and everyone is properly incented to ensure that that won't happen. Thank you, that's a great summation. Sonia? Sure, um, I agree with all of that. And I guess I would just say, um, a single piece of advice is find ways to elicit latent flexibility that already exists in your system um, and then work on ways to expose the value of new sources of both demand and supply side flexibility. Okay, thanks. Um, Cheryl? I was thinking really macro of what I've seen all of the markets right now um, certainly in the US and Canada and I'm sure around the world some of them Frank alluded to are trying to adapt to a whole new resource mix in a climate constrained world. And that's making all kinds of adaptations, whether they have capacity markets or not capacity markets, what kind of price caps they have. Under all those circumstances, everyone's going through change. And I think once the AESO thinks about what changes it needs to um, protect reliability for customers in this new climate constrained world, it's just going to be necessary to make a change, propose a change, make a change without really truly knowing in advance how it will operate in practice and be willing to adjust as necessary. Over the last decade, I've seen more market operators err by not being bold enough and figuring they can always go back for another bite at the apple than being 
too bold because we're just going entering a new world and they have to be willing to make a change, see how it works, be willing to say, oops, now we're going to refine it in this way or add this product and not be too cautious of like, oh, geez, 9,000 sounds high. Maybe we'll try halfway and then maybe we'll see. I just think that more danger lies in the other direction of just holding back too much than by actually taking a step into the future and being willing to study and adjust. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Jacob, last word to you. Uh, yeah, maybe one final thought is that, uh, I, of course, I've, I've advocated for embracing high scarcity pricing, but uh, even if uh, there's a mandatory contracting around that and, uh, and the load side of the market is completely hedged and will never pay those high scarcity prices, I think there's just a lot of information value uh, in those prices that uh, allow us to tell whether we're doing any good at uh, defining our long-term resource adequacy uh, uh, programs. And so uh, one final thought is just to embrace those high prices, even if you uh, don't want load to ever pay them. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. So with that, we're going we're gonna to wrap up. I'd just like to thank uh, you guys, the panelists, for, for taking the time to be here today. Uh, this wasn't, of course, what we intended when we organized this, uh, a, a round table, but uh, we did the best we could in a webinar event. And I thank all the attendees for, for taking the time today and your questions. I know there's a series here we didn't get to. Uh, happy to follow up with you uh, offline and then through, through emails and phone calls. So please feel free to contact. I'd also like to thank Ashley Cole and the events team at the, at the School of Public Policy for figuring out how to do this on such short notice. Um, I, it, I, from our point of view, there was no technical challenges. So I'm very pleased to see uh, this went off well. Uh, to that end, I, I would love your feedback. This is probably something we're gonna be living with for a few months now. And so to, um, like to hear your feedback on how the webinar went. Feel free to email me. Uh, uh, you can find my email on the Policy Schools website, but it's blake.shafer at ucalgary.ca. I'd love to get your feedback on the event and how it worked. And finally, look out for a summary paper. Sarah and I are gonna be trying to summarize what we've heard here today and, and further thoughts and, and providing that um, uh, to policymakers and industry alike. And I see someone has chatted my email on there, so thank you very much. Um, anyways, we'll say goodbye now, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Next time in Calgary. Thank you.